Chapter 24, Lily After Jewel's amazing leave, Lily opens the wardrobe door and peers out. Sure enough, the key is on the floor, and the door in her room is open. With some difficulty, she picks up the key. Her fingers don't work as well as they used to. Indeed, she has become rather clumsy. She studies the key. As Maisie said, she can lock herself in the room again. Or maybe, if she's brave, if she's theirs, if she trusts Jules, she can leave. She tiptoes to the open door. With the key in one hand and her other hand on the doorknob, Lily considers. She's been in this room for a long time. Hours and days and weeks and years. Too many to reckon up. She's waited for Mama and Papa. She's done what she was told to do. She knows why they never came back. They're dead. They've been dead since the night she locked herself in this room. If she stays here, she'll never see them again. How does she know this? Because they're dead. And now she knows what that means. And she's alive. Well, not exactly alive, but not exactly dead either. If It's as if she's been forgotten, left behind, and with no way to go forward or backward. She's trapped in a world that exists for no one but her and the killers who come for her. What will happen if she leaves the room? She takes a step over the threshold and takes a step backwards into the room. She, she wishes she knew what Papa and Mama want her to do. They've been gone too long for her to ask. They have no more substance than a shaft of sunlight. Lily looks out the door again. The hall is empty. It leads to the steps. What will she see if she goes downstairs? Her legs tremble, and she holds fast to the door frame to keep from falling. She's afraid of what she'll find in the house. While she hesitates, the sun comes up and paints in the colors the, the night took away. The workmen arrive. Their laughter booms in the empty rooms. Their voices bounce from wall to wall. Their heavy boots tramp back and forth on the floor beneath her. Doors open and slam shut. She creeps to the top of the stairs and pauses there. She holds her breath. Her toes grip the edge of the first step. She's poised like a driver, ready to plunge into deep water. She lowers one foot, then another. Slow, baby steps. She's afraid the stairs will creak, but the wood is silent under her bare feet. On the second floor, she stops and stares about in bewilderment. The furniture is gone. The rugs and the drapes are gone. The pictures are gone. The floor is splintered and uneven. There are streaks and stains and blotches of mold on the plaster walls. The roof must have leaked. A few tattered strips of wallpaper remain. Pink and blue flowers faded now to gray. Lily remembers helping Mama choose that pattern. She tightens her grip on the banister to keep herself from running back to safety of the studio, where nothing has changed. She looks down at the first floor. It's empty, ruined. The noisy men have torn it apart. Dust covers everything. The walls are open wood frameworks. She can see through them into every room. The workmen are in the parlor. They lounge about, standing in corners, leaning against walls, eating buns and drinking coffee from paper cups. They wear their strange yellow hats and working clothes and heavy boots. One spits on the floor. She stays in the shadow as she descends, stopping on every step to, to be certain nobody notices her. No one does. Lily tiptoes past the parlor. She should be in plain sight, but the men continue talking and laughing as if she isn't there. One man looks right at her, and she can not she can tell he doesn't see her. It's most peculiar. Moving into a patch of bright sunlight, that she stretches out her hand and looks for its shadow. It's not there. She lifts her foot. It casts no shadow either. She remembers trying to see herself in the mirror on the wardrobe door, how blurred and indistinct she was, more of a mist than a reflection. She'd wondered then if people could see her. Now she's sure they can't. Jules and Maisie won't see her, even with their eyes wide open. Invisibility gives Lily courage. If she can't be seen, she can't be hurt. She walks, walks right past a man and glides into the kitchen. It's stripped bare, like the rest of the house. Aunt Nellie's stove is gone, her sink too. The shells have disappeared along with all the pots and pans. She notices a new door. It must lead to the addition. She turns the knob, but it's locked. Through it, she hears voices. She smells bacon and remembers its smoky taste. Something in the empty place inside her aches. She looks out a window and sees a path that leads to the meadow where Papa kept his dairy cows. Summoning courage she didn't know she had, Lily slips outside through the open kitchen door. If no one can see her, she can go anywhere. The sun hurts her eyes and she stumbles, half blind. She doesn't remember how painfully bright sunlight is. She stands still and opens her eyes slowly. At first, she can't see anything but blobs of dark and light. Gradually, her eyes stop hurting and her vision clears. Her surroundings are familiar yet unfamiliar. Most of the trees are gone. What once was a green lawn is now a churned up field of red mud. Needles, milkweed, and Queen Anne's lace flourish where Mama's roses grow. She walks further from the house. Nothing is left of the barn except some stone foundation. 
Weeds and brambles grow in the pasture. Honeysuckle smothers sagging fences and broken stone walls. No hens peck at the dirt. No rooster struts and crows. No cows rest in the grass. No sheep graze in the upper meadow. No corn rustles in the breeze. No wheat rippling like waves. No one works in the fields. A blight has fallen on the farm. Once more, Lily is tempted to run back to Papa's studio and hide in the wardrobe. But in spite of the farm's desolation, the sky is blue and the sun is warm. It's good to be away from the dust and the dead insects and musty air. It's good to hear birds instead of hammers and saws and men and shouting. At last, Lily comes to the field and sees a willow tree. It's much taller than she remembers. She's not even sure it's the same tree. Another might have grown in its place. Except for the size of the willow, the field looks exactly the same as it did the day she and Papa and Mama had their last picnic by the stream. Wildflowers sway in the breeze. Birds sing. The sky arches overhead, a lovely shade of pure blue, the same blue as pa Papa's eyes. A terrible loneliness casts a dark shadow over Lily. She's by herself in the spot where she was happy and Mama and Papa. Nothing has changed. Everything has changed. Just as she's about to return to the house, Lily hears voices. Jules and Maisie are coming across the field. Lily hesitates. Half of her longs to be seen. The other half is terrified of being seen. She smooths her ragged nightgown. She touches her hair. It's wild and tangled and unwashed and uncombed and unbrushed. It's gone very long. In truth, it almost touches the ground. Mama would have had a conpition fit if she saw Lily outdoors in her nightgown, her hair uncombed and her feet bare. She decides to hide in the willow tree and watch the girls from above. Silently, she climbs from branch to branch, higher and higher. At some point, she realizes that she isn't actually climbing. She no longer needs to hold on to the limbs of, of the willow. She lets a breeze carry her to the top of the tree, and she perches there. The branches rock her gently. This must be what it's like to be a bird. If only she had wings, she'd fly high into the sky and look down at the earth. Oh, what sight she'd see. She watches Lily, she wa Lily watches Jules and Maisie brush aside the willow's drooping branches. They sit by the stream and dangle their feet in bare water. How small the girls are. How fragile. It breaks her heart to hear them talk and laugh. They do not know what Lily knows. She hopes they never will.